So if any of you were at the talk yesterday, Eric started um, by mentioning something about Wikipedia, and I think that's how I'd like to start this talk as well. Uh, Wikipedia is awesome. It, it's just kind of, it's hard to describe how amazing it is. If you think about the fact that uh, sort of a bunch of people spread all over the world have solved the very complicated task of writing an encyclopedia. And thinking, and, and all have, they've done this within the last 10 years. Uh, now, thinking about that, one begins to wonder what else could everyone in the world do if they could all sort of coordinate their activities on some kind of intellectual problem or task. And so this, my talk today will be about how we can think about taking a sort of Wikipedia style and applying it to research that we do as social scientists. And so the title, I mentioned two sort of things. Uh, so there's a lot of t thinking about this happening right now. It generally falls into one of two sort of um, uh, labels. Uh, one of the labels is crowdsourcing. So this was a term coined by uh, Jeff Howe, who's a writer at Wired. And roughly, the idea of crowdsourcing is taking a task that's usually done within an organization or a firm and then outsourcing it to the crowd. There's also a group of people who are talking about what they call citizen science, which is roughly getting citizens uh, involved in the scientific process. Um, and so my talk will be about sort of including lots of these things. And in general, I would say I'm going to try to talk about mass collaboration on scientific problems with no money changing hands. Uh, so that's the general scope of the things I want to talk about. So as scientists, we already work collaboratively on lots of things. We co-author papers, we have students, we do lots of things. But the number of people that we collaborate with is usually two, three, certainly less than a dozen. Uh, what if we could collaborate with a million people? What would that look like? What, how would we do that? What kinds of problems could we solve? Oh, thanks. Um, so the way I'm going to try to go about this is I'm going to review examples from many different fields and then try to draw some kind of orienting perspective about how, as social scientists, we should think about this. So to give a little bit of a broader sense, this is part of a book project I'm doing. This is also the first time I've ever presented this stuff, so I hear you like half-baked ideas. And so here is a half-baked talk, or quarter-baked talk. Um, another caveat to keep in mind is that all of the examples that I'll talk about are not from the social sciences. Uh, they're from biology, ecology, computer science, law, and I am not a biologist, computer scientist, lawyer, astronomer, or any of those things. So if you are from those fields, please forgive me while I uh, butcher uh, what you guys are doing. Um, but I do think it's interesting that most of the stuff that's happened so far has not been in the social sciences. And I'll talk, I guess, a little bit about why I think that is at the end. Um, so with that background in mind, uh, let's get started. So I think there are really mainly three kinds of uh, mass collaboration projects that we can think about as social scientists. One involves what I would call human computation projects. A next is what I would call open contest projects, and a third is what I would call distributed data collection. And so what I'm going to do in this talk is now go through examples of each of these types of problems, and then we'll come back to this sort of topology at the end. So first, I'm going to start with a human computation. And I think that one of the best examples of this is from a project called Galaxy Zoo that was done by a bunch of astronomers. So roughly, astronomers are interested in understanding um, things like the relationship between the shape and color of galaxies. So those are two galaxies. And it turns out that, in general, galaxies can be divided into two main types, elliptical galaxies and spiral galaxies. So the Milky Way, for example, is a spiral galaxy. And it also turns out that astronomers believe that elliptical galaxies are generally red, and spiral galaxies are generally blue. And so I don't know how the color comes out, but it turns out that's the way it is in this picture. Um, and so that was sort of the general consensus of what astronomers thought about galaxies. 
Some astronomers though, thought that, that there were important exceptions to this general rule, and that by studying blue elliptical galaxies or red spiral galaxies, we could learn interesting things about the way galaxies form. But the challenge is then to find examples of these things. Um, and so most of the existing ways of classifying galaxies from pictures involved using computer programs that assumed this relationship between color and shape. So using existing computer programs, it wasn't poss possible to find blue elliptical galaxies or red spiral galaxies. So what they needed was they needed a set of hand-classified galaxies. So have a human go through and decide which shape each galaxy is. So it turns out that this is a problem that humans are much better at doing than computers. And there's a general class of problems like that, and those kinds of problems tend to be good for human computation. Um, so what happened is there was a graduate student named Kevin Shawansky, uh, and he went through and he worked for seven 12-hour days to classify 50,000 galaxies. So he just literally sat there looking at these galaxies and classifying them. And, as, uh, and that was kind of a huge effort. Um, and they wrote a paper about this. Um, but the problem is that even working seven 12-hour days, that's basically a drop in the bucket. Uh, so that's only 5% of the approximately 1 million galaxies that have been photographed by something called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So new, something other than this was needed. He couldn't continue to work 12-hour uh, days indefinitely. And so this is another, this is I think a nice example also of where some of these problems come from. So it used to be that uh, collecting astronomical data was expensive, and so there was no database of a million galaxies. Then the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is a project where they have a, a big telescope that basically instead of looking for any particular thing, it just like takes a picture of everything and generates tons and tons of data. And so it used to be possible for astronomers to hand classify images, all the images they had. Now we have this new flood of data and hand classification isn't gonna work anymore. It's not gonna scale to match the new sources of data. So he was talking with uh, Chris Lintot and some other astronomers, and they ended up with this website, galaxyzoo.org. So anyone can go to this website. You see a picture of a galaxy there. And then on the right side of the screen, you see the ways that you can classify that galaxy. So in this case, you can classify uh, its shape, and then there are some other complexities as well. So. What happened? So how does this really work? So volunteers uh, come to the website and then they have a training that's about five minutes long and then they have to take a quiz and once they've passed this quiz, then they're astronomers. So usually, how many years does it take to get a PhD in astronomy? It takes a lot, but so it turns out that like there's a lot of things that the training, the amount of training that goes into getting a PhD is not necessary for doing a lot of the problems that we face. And so in this case, with a little bit of training, you can help in doing astronomical research. Um, people could classify as many or as few galaxies as they wanted during their visit. And many people found out about this through the media. So another common thing, another common problem we'll see over and over again with these citizen science projects is how do you get the citizens to show up, right? So. It's a hard problem. Uh, and so in this case, they were able to do it through the media because they have a very compelling and exciting story to tell. So what happened? So the first graph here, this is the number of days since the launch of the site. And this is the number of galaxy classifications. So there was 4 times 10 to the 7th. So for non-astronomers, that's uh, 40 million galaxy classifications uh, in about 180 days. Uh, and then this is the graph of the number of classifications per participant. So if people were at the talk yesterday, they'll reckon, remember the talk about the very unequal amounts of contribution. So here, these are the number of galaxies classified on the logarithmic scale. So this is like 10,000 classifications. There are a small number of people who did a huge number of classifications and many people who did just a small number of classifications. But again, this site can harvest all of the effort that people are willing to give. 
people who want to give a lot can, people who want to give a little can as well. Are those uh, 40 million are not uh, 40 million different? Because a lot of people would be classifying the same. Yes, reality. so this is one of the things that even though these people had only a small, so there was about a million galaxies. So they have about 40 classifications per galaxy. And that's one of the tricks of how a lot of these things work, which is that someone who has just five minutes of training is not going to be as good at doing this as a PhD student in astronomy. Uh, but if you have 40 people who have five minutes of training and you somehow average together what they've said, that potentially can be as good. Although not always. So one of the things that we'll see is that there are certain kinds of systematic biases that people have and even averaging over many systematic biases doesn't remove systematic bias. Um, so then the challenge is to take these 40 million classifications and then produce consensus labels for the galaxy. So I'm going to talk a little briefly about a couple of the steps that they went through. This is uh, leaving out a lot of the complexity. So the first step that, you have, that they went through was cleaning. So they had to get rid of uh, some junk. Uh, so whenever you have something like this on the open web, weird stuff can happen. Uh, so if, for example, if people double click on the picture, they can potentially send two answers. You don't want to, you want to remove that. Uh, sometimes people can figure out your URL structure and try to submit many classifications for a single galaxy. So they had to, they removed any classification from someone who had classified more than two galaxies more than five times each. So basically there's like a set of data cleaning that you have to do before you start to do anything else. Uh, then there's some debiasing, so you have to realize that even though you're averaging over lots of people, if there are systematic problems, you need to deal with those. Um, so for example, people tended to classify far away spiral galaxies as ellipticals because the, the spiral arms are harder to see if the galaxy is far away. So they have a way of handling that. And then lastly, you have to combine, let's say, approximately 40 labels into one consensus label. And so what they did is they, they have a, a matrix of classifiers, those are like people, and classifications. And then so instead of doing a simple average, what they try to do is find people who are better at classifying than other people and sort of upweight and downweight the good and bad classifiers. So if you do all this, put all this together, you get something that produces data in similar quality to the stuff that was done by professional astronomers. Um, and the reason to go through, I'm not going to go through this much detail in each of the examples, but I do want to say it's not like you just put the stuff on the web and then boom, the data comes out. It's like there's a lot of being careful that has to happen here. Uh, and I even left out a lot of the complexities involved in this. Um, so now I'm going to try to give a sort of general recipe which uh, is a way of thinking about how Galaxy Zoo worked. And then once we understand that recipe, then we can see how that recipe is sort of used in other human computation problems. I think a good way to think about it is um, in this way of thinking about distributed computing. So there's something called MapReduce, which is a, uh, a sort of way of doing computing that was developed at Google. So taking a big problem and spreading it out over lots of little computers and then sort of aggregating the results. So it allows you to process large amounts of data. So if you know uh, Hadoop, Hadoop is like an open source uh, MapReduce. But I think the term MapReduce is actually kind of confusing. And there, this statistician named Hadley Wickham has this thing that he calls the split apply combine recipe, which I think is much easier to understand. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So you have a big problem. You split it up into lots of little problems. Then some operation is applied on each of those little pieces. And then those pieces are all somehow combined to produce the output that you want. So we have a set of pictures of galaxies. We split those up into one picture of each galaxy. Then apply, the operation that we apply is having a human um, uh, classify it. And then we do all those cleaning, debiasing, uh, merging is the combined step. 
Now, each of these steps, so the Galaxy Zoo is sort of the cleanest example of this. So the split step can be more complicated depending on what your problem is. The apply step can be more complicated. How you decide which uh, problem to send to which machine can be more, machine, person, whatever, how, that can be more complicated. How you combine can be more complicated, but that's sort of, I think, the general steps. Um, so now that we see this recipe, let's look at some other examples. So another example is what's called the ESP game, and this was developed by uh, Luis Van Aan and Laura Davish. And Luis Van Aan is sometimes considered to be one of the, the fathers of this field of human computing. And so the, the goal of the ESP game is also to solve a problem that computers have a hard time doing, but humans are easy, I can do it very easily, which is attaching labels to images. So, for example, if you wanted to do image search, like Google image search, uh, and you type in cat, you want to see pictures of cats, but it's very hard for a computer to look at a picture and say, this is a picture of a cat. But it's very easy for a human to say, oh, that's a picture of a cat. Um, so the idea is, how can we get humans to classify, put these labels on lots of images? And so they came up with this game. And the way it works is the following. You're playing this game, you're, you get to see this, in this case, the picture of this man with a beard and a hat. Um, and then in this box, you type in words, and your goal is to match the word that your partner has. So you've been paired up with someone else who you don't know, and you have to type the same word as that other person. The only thing that you share in common is this picture. And so the first thing you might type would be hat, hoping that the other person will type hat. Or maybe you would type suspenders or red. You would keep typing things until the other person has also typed something that you type, and then you've matched. So that's the gameplay. It, it's actually quite fun. I know it, doesn't, it might not seem fun right now, but it is actually quite enjoyable. Um, so here's a sort of picture of what it looks like from the perspective of the website. So in this case, the image is this picture of a purse. So player one has typed purse, bag, brown. Player two has typed handbag and purse. Purse matches. And so they then move on to a new picture. But from this perspective, you can see what we're doing here is we're capturing labels. So we've set up a system here where people want to give you accurate labels because they want to match with the other person. So this is a very sort of clever design to get people to attach labels to images in a way that's actually enjoyable for them. And so uh, Varan and his group have had about 200,000 um, people play this that have contributed more than 50 million image labels. Um, and so that's like another example of a sort of human computation problem. Another one also comes from Luis Varan and his group. Uh, it's called reCAPTCHA. And the way this one works is the following. So the problem here is that they want to scan in old books, and they want to digitize them. And so when you scan a book, you can use optical character recognition, and that generally does a good job of converting the picture of a book into the um, sort of uh, a text file that you can search and index and so on. Um, but for old books, or for books that are damaged, the optical character recognition doesn't work very well. So you could imagine hiring people to actually take all the words that weren't able to be recognized and type them in, but Von Ahn and colleagues have come up with a much more clever approach. Um, and they, uh, it base, it's built on this idea of a CAPTCHA. So these are things on the web that you maybe have seen these before, where you have to type in a strange sequence of letters in order to prove that you're a human being. So if you are trying to, let's say, create a Gmail account, you would have to type this in to prove that you're a human being and not a robot that's creating a million Gmail accounts to start spamming people. So what they've done with reCAPTCHA is the following. They give you two CAPTCHAs. One of these CAPTCHAs is actually something that they already know the answer to. The other one is a failed OCR from a digitized book. So you type in both one of which serves as a CAPTCHA, the other of which serves to digitize the books. 
And so in this case, they have a very clever way of sort of taking advantage of work that people are already doing anyway and to solve this other problem of digitizing the books. And so far, they at, at currently they're at a pace of about 100 million words per day, uh, 2.5 million books per year. And they also have a very clever way of solving the participant problem. So remember I said one of the problems is how do you get people to do this? So they basically <coughs> crowdsource the problem of finding participants. So people will use this reCAPTCHA in their, so like Facebook or uh, Google or Ticketmaster, those websites want to have CAPTCHAs and so they use reCAPTCHA and that's the source of traffic for reCAPTCHA. So they've t they don't, so reCAPTCHA doesn't have to go and look for people, websites find reCAPTCHA and then that is the source of the people. So it's a very clever system to sort of solve all of these problems but again there's lots of complexity in terms of how you actually aggregate all the different things that people have typed in to get the, the words. So, so those three sort of human computation problems were sort of review some ideas from that. So they generally have this split uh, apply com uh, combined structure. They have a strong amount of researcher control. So the researcher really has to have the material at the beginning and know what they want people to do with it, and then have a clever way of getting the people to do it. So in some sense, one way you can get people to do it is they want to help science, so that was sort of like the Galaxy Zoo. You can try to make it enjoyable, so this is like the ESP game. And in fact, some people think Galaxy Zoo is enjoyable. Uh, I personally don't think Galaxy Zoo is very enjoyable, but I do see the benefit of doing Galaxy Zoo to help science. And then you could also, imagine trying to have people do these tasks as a byproduct of some other tasks that they're already doing. Um, so this is a, sort of one way of thinking about the set of human computation problems. Uh, I should also add that if any time you have questions or ideas or stuff, just feel free to jump right in. <coughs> um, okay, so then the next... Uh, for for yeah. the uh, ESP game, yeah. pe people knew that this was for this purpose. Because they weren't just thinking they were playing a game and not knowing that they were helping somebody label things, or did, or was it, was there a subterfuge? Um, so this is one issue that comes up in these human computation problems: is to what extent do people know what they're doing? Um, and so with the Galaxy Zoo, it's very clear people know that they're helping these astronomers. With the ESP game, I believe it's the case that people told they were playing a game to help label images. Um, with reCAPTCHA, it's much less clear. Um, so this is an issue that was brought up by um, Jonathan Zetrain, which is that, so if you, let's say you have an, you have some sort of control over the kind of work that you do. So like, let's say you don't like nuclear weapons, you can choose not to work for a company that builds nuclear weapons. Um, with reCAPTCHA, it's not as clear. So he could be using this to like uh, do OCR for nuclear weapons recipes. Uh, and you would never know uh, that you were helping to support nuclear weapons while you're um, trying to buy tickets on Ticketmaster. Um, so this is sort of one of the, the downsides of um, trying to do this stuff as a byproduct. So just to be clear, I don't think he is actually digitizing nuclear weapon recipes. Um, but more generally, this brings up the issue, in a lot of these human computation problems, uh, people use people, uh, workers from Mechanical Turk. So do you guys know what Mechanical Turk is? Okay, so Mechanical Turk is a, a labor market um, that's run by Amazon, where the tasks that you um, want people to do are sort of micro tasks, like one or two minutes. And so there's this huge pool of people on Mechanical Turk that are waiting to do these micro tasks that are um, things that are easy for humans to do but hard for computers to do. So you could, for example, want them to, let's say you have a uh, thousand restaurants websites and you want someone to classify the restaurants for the type of food that they serve. 
So that would be something that would be hard to write a program to do potentially, but pretty easy for a human to do. You might not want to hire a human full time to do that, and you can just sort of put that task out on Mechanical Turk and have people do it from there. And so in some ways it's very nice because the labor supply is very flexible. There's lots of people out there. You can do things very fast because it's a big labor supply. And it's a very sort of arm's length relationship. You put up the task, they do it, you pay them a small amount. The pay that they get is actually quite low. Uh, and so there are some issues about whether they should be receiving minimum wage and so on. The labor laws of Mechanical Turk are certainly not well worked out. Um, so th there are a number of sort of kind of, I would say, ethical or human subjects kind of issues that come up in, in a lot of this work. Because in general, what we're doing is we're involving a much bigger set of people and how we get those people to contribute, so we have to sort of work out systems that make sense, that are fair for us and fair for them. Yeah. Um, well, just on the on the recapture, yeah. it didn't look to me like the word that was being, uh, you know, the, the user was being asked to spell was an actual word. So when they're doing optical character recognition, and it's on behalf of um, uh, um, deciphering the words that yeah. are not caught. You know, if if they if they've got nonsense in the in the recapture word, how is that helping? Yeah, so in this case, my guess is that this was the, the actual word from a book and that this was oh, I see. The, the one where they knew the answer. Oh, okay. I guess so there's one where they know the answer, that's a trick, and then one that's data. So they can both provide a service and collect data at the same time. If they could type in anything for the first one, and it, and it would be accepted by Ticketmaster. Correct. But then the beauty is they have many people. Yeah, right, I understand. And then they do the averaging. But the user only correct. only has to get the right hand one correct, correct. in order to get, enter the. In this side. case, if we if yeah. we actually knew that that was the known and the other one was the unknown, I'm not sure in this case. But yeah. So they just accept the average as like the answer, or is there a final human? No, no. So I, I don't know exactly how they do the combined step. So one thing I would guess is that if they see words that there's a lot of disagreement, they would show those words more frequently until there was some consensus reached. Because again, there's a high degree of control that you have. You get to serve the words. Um, and I would guess eventually if there's a lot of inconsistency, then they could show it to a human. But if you, if you can show one word in 10,000 to a human, you've saved a tremendous amount of time, even if humans still need to do a small amount of the work. You mean um, employed humans? Employed, employed humans, correct. <laughs> the other yes. people as well as they know. <laughs> they are humans as well. That's true. Um, OK, so that's a little bit about human computation. Now I want to turn to something else called open contests. So again, this involves getting lots of people involved, but the way that they get involved is actually quite different. Uh, and I think one of the best examples of an open contest is the Netflix prize. So uh, as many of you know, Netflix is a, a company that rents DVDs and actually now streams DVDs. And one of the things that they would like to be able to do is recommend movies to you based on the movies you've already watched. So the idea that they have is the more that you enjoy their service, the more likely you are to stay as a subscriber. And they think one way to get you to enjoy their service is to be able to recommend good movies to you. So the problem is, given the movies that you've already watched and the ratings that you've assigned them on a scale of one to five stars, and given the ratings that everyone else has assigned to all the other movies that Netflix has, um, how can they predict which movies you'll like and then recommend those to you? So, they had an in-house research group working on this problem for a long time and they developed the system, but then they tried to open this up to the rest of the world. So they released uh, what's called a training set which had about 100 million movie rank uh, ratings that were nested within is about half a million users and about 20,000 movies. Um, and then they held back a test set where they had 1.5 million ratings that they didn't actually release. So, for example, they released that user one gave movie one two stars and gave movie two five stars, 
And then they actually know what rating user one gave movie 20,000, but they hold that back. And so the challenge that they pose to people is, given the numbers that you see, how can you predict what is in the question mark? And the beauty here is that Netflix actually knows what's behind the question mark. Um, and that's a key feature of this kind of system. So, for example, you might say, well, movie one, it doesn't seem very good, and user 500,000 seems to be kind of cranky, so I'm guessing this question mark will probably be a low rating. That would be one way you could try to solve this problem. Um, so here we have a problem where the goal is very clear. It's what's behind the question marks, but the way to get there is not clear at all. In fact, Netflix doesn't know. I mean, Netflix has a way of doing it, but they realize that there may be better ways that they don't know. And so they open it up to the world, and they offer a prize of $1 million. Um, so I said that no money was going to change hands in the examples that I talked about. This is one where money does change hands, quite a bit of money. But if you talk to the people, if you read the interviews of the people who worked on this, the, this $1 million does not seem to have been a big motivating factor for them at all. Uh, a lot of people seem to think it was very fun and neat and cool data. Um, some companies let their employees work on it, um, mainly because it thought, they thought that it added skills to their employees that they could then use on other consulting projects. So there is a million dollars, <laughs> but that doesn't seem to be a main motivator for many of the people. Um, so Netflix received uh, about 44,000 submissions. So submissions are guesses about what's behind these question marks <laughs> from about 5,000 teams. Now, the, the challenge is that, I mean, imagine you get 44,000 journal articles or whatever. It's like, how do you, you can't, you can't sort through these. It's a mess. Um, so, but fortunately, Netflix did not have to do that because they have a very clear criteria, which is the root mean square error. So, you upload your predictions for what's behind the question mark. Netflix knows what's behind the question mark. They just calculate the root mean square error, and then they see how good this is. So, let me give you a very clear example of how powerful this is. It seems very simple, but it's actually super helpful. If you want to open yourself up, to receive 44,000 submissions, then you need some way of handling that. And so let me give this particular example. So this is a blog post. Um, I love the picture at the beginning. Um, so I just wanted to show you that. So this is someone made this blog post uh, about how he went about trying to solve the Netflix problem. And I want to highlight here one of the key passages of this post. Uh, it was. His, this screen name is Sifter, and this actual person's name is Simon Funk. So I'm going to read this. Uh, so in other words, if we take a rank 40 singular value decomposition of the 8.5 billion matrix, we have the best least square approximation we can do within the limits of our user rating, movie rating model, i.e. the SVD has found our best generalization for us. Pretty neat, eh? Only problem is we don't have 8.5 billion entries. We have 100 million entries and 8.4 billion empty cells. Okay, there's another problem too, which is that combining, calculate, computing the SVD of generous matrices is, well, no fun unless you're into that sort of thing. But just because there are 500 really complicated ways of computing singular value decompositions in the literature doesn't mean there isn't a really simple way of doing it too. Just take the derivative of the approximation error and follow it. This has the added bonus that we can simply choose to ignore the unknown error of the 8.4 billion empty slots. So yeah, you mathy guys are rolling your eyes right now as it dawns on you how short the path was. So, is this a good idea or not? Okay, so imagine you had 44,000 of these to look through, um, but the beauty is that Netflix can find out very quickly. So it turns out that using this idea, he quickly jumped into third place. Um, and so people have been working, many, many, many human hours had gone into trying to solve the Netflix prize. And with this one clever idea of using a singular value decomposition, he immediately jumped into third place. And the beauty then is that uh, everyone in the world quickly found out 
about this idea, and then basically they sort of put him out of the top ten again. So if he, he sort of put himself out of the million dollars because he wanted to share the neat thing that he had figured out. Uh, yeah? I just want to make sure I understand. He jumped to third place based on his really good mean squared error value, not Correct. on the clever text that he wrote. No, 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 not the clever text. <laughs> the, uh, the actual idea. Um, and then instead of keeping it secret, he chose to share it with everyone else. And then there, you know, he says there are 500 really complicated ways of calculating a singular value decomposition. Well, all those people who had developed those 500 ways uh, and all the other people working on the Netflix bars quickly read about those other ways and then were able to improve upon this. But basically, so if I remember correctly, he was either in Australia or New Zealand at a youth hostel when he made this blog post. So he was like backpacking around. And this is amazing because there's this huge pool of people working on this problem. And there's this one person in a hostel somewhere who has a very good idea. And instantly, everyone in the world who's working on this problem is aware that here's a new really good idea and they're all able to start working on it then. So I mean, if you think about all the kinds of, think about how many journal articles are written every year and we can't possibly read them all, so we use various kinds of filtering mechanisms to decide what to read. We look at what journal it's in or maybe what university the person works at or where the person works if they don't work at a university. And those are very, weak signals potentially. There could be a lot of great things out there that we just don't know, but we have no way of finding them because this, though, gives a way of everyone working on the problem to instantly know that this is a good idea. And because he shared it, everyone else was able to benefit from that. And that's very cool. <clears throat> and that only happened because of the structure of this problem, which is that the solutions are easier to check than they are to generate. So if you say to Netflix, here's a solution, Netflix can check it really easily. Netflix can't generate the solution, but it can check it. And that asymmetry is what makes these open contests possible. So we're not used to thinking about problems that have this asymmetry, I think. In the social sciences, let me give you another example. So this asymmetry comes up a lot in cryptography. So if I ask you, what are the prime factors of 2 billion, 232 billion, blah, 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 that's a hard problem. To prime factorize a big number is hard. If I asked you, are 105,943 and 2,191,459 prime factors of that big number, that's a much easier problem. And so here's another case where a solution, once someone gives you a solution, you can check whether it's right or not. It's much easier than it is to generate the solution itself. Okay, so now I'm going to give a couple other examples of open contests that take advantage of this sort of asymmetry. Um, first is a project <laughs> called Peer to Patent um, that was introduced in this uh, article by Beth Novick and is now a pilot project of the U.S. Uh, Patent and Trademark Office. Um, and so the way it works is the following. So patents get filed to the patent office and then a patent examiner has to decide if there is prior art, among other things. They have to decide if there's prior art to know whether they can grant this patent or not. Um, but it's actually quite hard for the patent examiner to find all the prior art. Um, usually they have about 20 hours to work on each patent. They're often not specific subject. I mean, they're, they know about the area they're working in, but they receive patents on a lot of different things, so they might not be an expert in any particular thing and patents are particularly confusing. Uh, so here is this one specific example. This is patent number 2007-0118658. Uh, it was filed by Hewlett Packard for a user selectable management alert format. And you can sort of read the, the text of this patent uh, to get some sense that it's quite difficult to know even really what they're talking about. Um, so you're a patent examiner, you have to find out if there's prior art, how do you do it? So basically in the past, the patent office, they've had the patent examiners look through databases that the patent office has and the work is done by one examiner. So what the peer to patent project does is sort of crowdsource this search for prior art. So the people sort of can research the patent and find the prior art, then they 
upload the prior art to the website. They uh, actually link specific parts of the prior art to specific parts of the patent and then vote and then the 10 pieces of prior art that are thought to be the best as voted on by the visitors to the site get sent to the patent examiner. And then the patent examiner does the normal patent review in addition but gets this set of the top 10 as voted on by the communities to help. So the community does not make the patent decisions which is probably good but the community provides a key piece of input which can help the patent examiner. Um, and so in this case of the patent we just discussed, there was someone named Steve Pearson who worked at IBM who found a piece of prior art which was a manual from Intel which had a totally different name. I have no idea how he found it. And that went to the peer to patent site, went to the patent examiner, and then the patent examiner rejected the patent because of this piece of prior art. Yeah? So Matt, what motivates the peers to do that? Are you going to talk about that? Mm, I can talk about it. So one thing is um, people, so there's some, there's a community of people who do not like software patents. Uh, so there's like an open source kind of community. Um, also many companies don't like a lot of software patents either. And so the reason so these are some reasons why people do it. Also, the site is set up so that you get like a little um, badge or something every time a piece of prior art that you upload gets cited in a um, patent examiner uh, decision. And so there is like a top 10. People want to be in the top 10. Um, so one of the things about that, the... That's the contest part of it. It's the content. Yeah. The other part is just collaboration. Yeah, so... Or so, would IBM pay Steve Pearson to do this? So they did not in this case, but if okay. this... So this system is really... It's still a, a pilot, and so they've done on the order of hundreds of patents like this. The patent office is very uh, slow to change, which is maybe a good thing. Uh, so they're trying this out. It's been going on for a while. And so if this becomes a sort of mainstream part of the patent process, it's very conceivable that uh, open source organizations like the Free Software Foundation would try to pay people to do this, or people at other technology companies would, would be paid to do this, or uh, student, law students, any number of people. So one thing is that a lot of these projects, it's, uh, it's kind of hard for us to think about who's gonna do them, but the set of people collected to the inter connected to the internet is a huge set of people, right? And so we're talking about, you know, one in a million, if one in a million people do this, that's a lot of people. Um, yeah? Well, I was just going to note that when the insider community structured around this, the way that you yes. described it, um, being in that top 10 can serve as a form of capital. Yeah. Right? And so I've heard some of people getting jobs and having a this go really well in genre is that you've established yourself as a sort of internet person within this niche mm -hmm. community. Yeah. And so is it, I think this, insofar as you can turn that award system into a capital generating. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. This is a motivational purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, the, absolutely. So, in some ways, people outside of our sociology community probably think the lists that we have are very silly too <laughs> and not very important. <laughs> like, I can't believe they're so motivated by being on those lists. Right, but, so, I think that's a good point though, that once you have something that is a credential or something that's assigned to you as an individual, also this site, they use real names, not screen names, and now it's part of the design principle. So they've actually thought a lot about how to make this into a community, and um, Beth Novick, Novick's book talks about that in more detail. Um, but, you know, we talked about other, you know, what motivates people, what gets people involved, community, uh, they also try really hard to get discussions happening between people, which is another thing that can be motivating for people to participate. Yeah? Um, I'm not really familiar with the patent process, mm -hmm. but aren't companies typically pretty secretive about their... Like, yeah, so why, are, why, would, uh, why would HP post this patent on the internet? Yeah, so... Oh, well, HP posts it? No, so, so how do they get the companies to participate? Um, and what they do... So the, the thing is there's like a long... Um, waiting list at the patent office to have your patent reviewed. And 
if you agree to go through this peer to patent process, they move your patent to the front of the queue as part of this pilot program. Okay, so it's optional. It's optional. And the other reason that companies like to do it, uh, supposedly, is that this leads to stronger patents because sometimes what will happen is someone will upload a piece of prior art and then the company can amend their application and then they have a stronger patent. Um, because what the company, companies do not want to have bad patents go to trial and lose at trial. So they'd rather, if the patent is not good, they have incentive to try to find that out early and this system allows for that. So this, is a very, this system, it's very clever how they've, there's a lot of competing interests going on here and this has found a very nice way to align them into this task that sort of everyone ends up winning when this thing works better. It's a very nice design. Um, so the last open contest that I'll talk about is in a totally different area of biology. Uh, it's a website called Foldit and um, basically what people do there is they do protein folding. And so here's how it works. So this is a, a screenshot from the, the, it's actually a game. And so, so a, a big problem in biology is to know what shape a protein will ultimately end up in. And then that somehow helps you to make better medicine and all kinds of other things. But so they want to know what shape a given protein will end up in. And it turns out that they, proteins tend to end up in what they call the lowest energy configuration. Now, then the problem is finding what that configuration is for this particular protein. And so if I give you a protein, you can calculate the energy of its configuration. And if I give you a different one, if I like, so basically the way the game works is like, the player rotates this around, moves this thing here, moves this. Like, it's basically like a Rubik's Cube kind of thing. And all the while, the, the game is calculating the amount of energy in the configuration, how much closer the player is to moving this thing to the lowest energy state. And so here's your score. And so you don't need to know anything about biology. All you need to know is you want a higher score. And so you do all these different moves to the protein to get a higher score and actually what you're doing is solving this very complicated biology problem. And so they have algorithms to try to do this but it turns out that these algorithm, computer algorithms fall into certain traps that humans are able to avoid because humans are just in, in certain ways smarter than computers. Um, and so one of the things that they've done is they've uh, worked on problems where the protein structure is unknown. They put it into fold it. Then you can actually find the actual protein structure using some kind of crystallography or something, but that's expensive and slow. So in general, this protein folding community, they have these contests that they say, okay, we're about to find the actual shape of this protein. Everyone try to predict it. So it's a real prediction because no one knows, and then they can measure it but it's expensive to do, so then they do these contests all the time. And so in this case, on 10 unknown uh, structures, the gamers were out to able to outperform the best known computational algorithms. So people are able to do this problem, but this is, a, again, a problem where you, you don't average all the different solutions that people give you. You look, people are trying to solve this problem, you find the one with the highest score, and then that's your best prediction. So this also involves a mix of collaboration and computation. Some people work on these puzzles by themselves, some people work on them in teams, and so on. But this also has a structure that, you know, if I give you a protein in a certain configuration, you can calculate the score, but it's very hard for you to find the highest score possible, the lowest energy possible and people seem to be able to do it. And you don't need a bio, you don't get a biology degree after five minutes of training? No, you don't even need, a, I mean that's the other amazing thing is that they've taken this, it's, I, mean, I don't understand the biology involved here at all, uh, but you don't need to, to play the game. I mean it's a game, it's a, it's a puzzle. And people like playing it, and people are good at it. 
Um, it actually, it seems to be the case that, so they've tried to figure out, like, they have people who are really good at this and they can find them by their score, and then they've gone and interviewed some of them. A lot of the top scorers do not have any training in biology. They just really like to play this game. Can they find out how it is that they're so good? So that's one of the things that they've tried to do is, like, see what strategies people are using. So one of the sort of longer term goals is you can figure out what strategies people are using and then you can try to build those into the algorithms. And so one of the ways that they've done that is they allow people to create these like uh, recipes which are basically like little programs that people can run uh, on their protein and then people can also share these programs with other people. So there's a very neat paper that just came out um, where they looked at all the programs that were used, these recipes, and there was one recipe that was used more than all the others, something called, I think it was called Blue Fuse. And then they looked at this recipe and they saw that it was very similar to something that their, people in their group were developing at that time, like an algorithm that they were developing that was not published. And this recipe outperformed the existing published algorithm for this aspect of the protein folding problem and was very similar to what they were developing and in fact for the range of problems considered in fold it was better than the thing that they had developed in their group. So that's another thing that I'll talk about a little bit more later is not only can people solve the problems that you can give them, they can potentially develop more general, they can do things that you didn't even expect at the beginning. If you can design your system in a way that enables you to figure out when these things are happening. So in this case, because they could see which program, which recipes have been used many times, that told them which, to there's like 5,000 recipes, so they can't look at all of them, but they saw, oh, this one's been used many, many times, let's check it out. The, yeah? This may be a cynical kind of question, but are there people who are threatened by this be precisely because it seems to mm. make them superfluous in a way? Uh, the, as far as, I don't know. I don't know if the biology, the protein folding community feels threatened by this. From, all, from everything I've seen so far, they seem interested, but I don't know. Um, okay, so these open contests, so in general, the solutions are easier to check than they are to generate. It's a take the best approach, not any kind of combining. And many of these tend to blend cooperation and competition. Yeah? Going back to the protein folding yeah. example, I mean, I'm still worried about Simon Funk and somebody else getting the million dollars. Oh, yeah. You know? But, and here, I mean, is, is the organization that's doing this other algorithm that they haven't published yet, are they going to do something commercial with that algorithm? Uh, that they've been going to, you know. Yeah. I don't know. So, the, so the particular paper, I mean, the paper was published in PNAS. The, you can read the paper. It, it, they publish it open access too, which is cool. Uh -huh. um, so what they're going to do with it ultimately, I don't know if they sell their code, if their code is open source. I don't know any of those things. Um, so what, what time is this supposed to end? It goes till 5.30. Oh, good. Okay. So the last um, class of things is what I would call distributed data collection. And it's different than, so in the others, you generally have the data to start with and you want people to analyze that data for you. Distributed data collection, you want them to actually give you the data. So we actually do something like this in social science when we would like hire uh, Gallup to do a survey for us. That's a form of distributed data collection where we pay people to collect certain data for us. Um, and if you've ever worked with a big survey company, you realize it's actually quite hard <laughs> to do very well uh, if you want really high quality data. So it seems kind of crazy that you can just open this up to volunteers to do data collection, but as we'll see, it, that for certain kinds of things, it seems to be possible. Um, so the sort of first example of distributed data collection I want to talk about is this project called eBird that's run out of the ornithology lab at Cornell. And uh, basically what it does is it, uh, people who go birding, uh, so birding is a hobby. People, some people like to go look for birds. And these people often keep like diaries or logs of all the birds that they see. 
And so eBird is a place where you can upload your logs and then they aggregate all the birding data that people have uploaded from all over and then they're able to know where the birds are. And so this actually builds on, so ornithology is one of the first fields to do citizen science, astronomy and ornithology. Ornithology, there, there was this project uh, in Finland in the 1700s. Because, so one of the big problems in ornithology seems to be migration. So if you want to study bird migration, you pretty clearly need to involve lots of people because no one research team can cover the entire scale of the migration. So this field has a long history of trying to do these kinds of projects, but with the advent of the web, it becomes much easier to do at a massive, massive scale. And so this eBird also has <coughs> the, the, the sort of feature that it takes advantage of work that's already happening. So just like reCAPTCHA, people are already filling out CAPTCHAs on the web, so maybe we can get some data out of that process. Here, bird watchers are already going out and looking for birds, and so we can sort of take advantage of what these people are already doing. And in the end, they have you know, 48 million <coughs> observations from 35,000 contributors, a huge amount of data, the biggest uh, citizen science ornithology project by a factor of a thousand. Um, there are other projects as well, um, but many of them are sort of pre-internet era, so they're much smaller, more tightly controlled. And that leads to actually one of the problems with eBird is that the data is very hard to analyze because it's not very tightly controlled. So it seems to be the case that they're over-reporting of rare species, under-reporting of common species. So for example, near where I live in New Jersey, there's tons of these Canada geese. They're just everywhere. And like, if you're, you know, you're not gonna write, oh, I see 27, K. it's just, people just don't, don't seem to do that very much. Uh, another problem challenge is that if you look at the eBird data, it looks like there are no birds in North Dakota or Nevada, <laughs> um, which of course is not true, but there are no bir not as many birders in those places. So the data that you have tends to be where people are, which is not necessarily where the birds are. And then another problem is that the observation protocols are not standardized. So apparently, so a lot of birders apparently do what's called casual observation, which is just sort of looking around. Um, but ornithologists have different sort of protocols. So there's the traveling count, there's the stationary count, there's the area count. I don't know what those are, but they're very specific things that are clearly defined and many volunteers don't do them. And so it makes it harder to interpret the data. So actually eBird is doing something kind of clever and they're trying to encourage people, they take the data that you give under casual observation and then they try to steer you into doing these more standardized observations, but still a lot of the data is collected in a way that renders the analysis complicated. And people are working on different ways of handling this data structure. Um, so another pro so that's people reporting about birds. Another problem uh, project has people reporting about themselves. So this is a project called InfluenzaNet, um, which is a sort of pan-European project to monitor influenza. So influenza is the flu, and uh, every winter uh, the flu comes, and it can be quite dangerous and. For public health reasons, we'd like to know how much flu there is at any given time. And so maybe some of you, so many of these, many countries, including the US and these European countries, have an influenza surveillance system that involves doctors and laboratories reporting to a central ministry of health, who then publish this data and make it available. And many of you may have heard about the Google project, where they use search terms to try to predict how much influenza there is. So this is a different approach, which involves having a panel of volunteers report about their influenza symptoms. And so it's an opt-in sample. People can, you can volunteer to be in this project, which since none of you, I don't think anyone lives here and lives in Europe, so I hope you don't volunteer, uh, but you potentially could. Uh, and then you fill out a survey every week, which you give information about your symptoms and how you're feeling and so on. So for people who do a lot of work with surveys, you might be very concerned about what kind of people are opting in to be in this influenza panel. Um, and they've done work where they compare it to the census and they see that it underrepresents the very young people, uh, underrepresents very old people, 
which is particularly bad because those are the groups that are at highest risk for influenza. They're also, <clears throat> you have to fill out this survey weekly, so there's a lot of problems with non-response. Many people don't actually fill it out every week. The advantage of having this panel, though, is that if there's something about the influenza that you don't know about ahead of time, you can easily add it into the survey. So let's imagine, so swine flu in 2009 was a novel influenza, and let's imagine that um, like swine flu was associated with diarrhea or something. And so there's a new kind of flu, and you want to know, do the people have, a lot of people have diarrhea, you might not have built that into your standard influenza surveillance system. That's actually very slow and hard to change. But if you have this panel that comes weekly, you can add that question in very quickly. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. It also allows you to capture information from people who don't go to doctor's offices. So one problem also with these doctor office uh, systems is that when swine flu is in the newspaper, potentially many more people will go to the doctor's office. So that can distort what you're doing as well. So there are a lot of reasons why you'd want to try this, um, despite these sampling problems. And so here's some data actually from the Netherlands and Belgium from 2007. So the, the solid line is the influenza, uh, prep. so the x-axis here is time, the month. The solid line is the influenza prevalence as measured by the doctor's office traditional uh, measurement system, and the dashed line is as measured by the internet panel. Uh, one thing you cannot see for sure is that these things are off by a factor of 10. <laughs> so this is per 1,000. This is per 10,000. So I know you could not read that. Uh, and in the paper, they talk a little bit about why that might be, that you detect higher rates of influenza from the, the panel because they don't, people get influenza and don't always go to the doctor. Um, so this is called the Photo City Project. And uh, it was motivated by this project called Rome in a Day. Uh, and what this Rome in a Day project was is that a bunch of computer scientists went on to Flickr and scraped all the pictures of Rome. And then they tried to make a 3D reconstruction of Rome using these static two-dimensional images. So here is a reconstruction of the Colosseum using static two-dimensional images that were uploaded to Flickr. So these here are the cameras, actually. So from all of their ways of piecing together all these images, they can figure out where people are and make this 3D reconstruction. And so these are the cameras and the angles that the cameras are aimed at, and together they're able to do this. So one of the things, the challenges that they encountered, though, was that it seems to be the case that on Flickr, many people take exactly the same picture of the Colosseum. Like, apparently, so it's, it's kind of, I haven't really thought about it, but like, people take the like postcard picture of the Colosseum, and if everyone takes that, then that's actually not very helpful for your reconstruction, right? What you want is a much more diverse set of pictures, pictures from different angles and different sides and so on. And so the Photo City game is about trying to get a way to collect this data, make a fun way for people to upload these valuable pictures of buildings. And so this was done on two colleges campuses at University of Washington and Cornell. And they had a game where uh, you have different buildings, and then there are these flags around the buildings. And if you upload pictures from these different areas, you can capture this flag for yourself or your team. And then the, you, you can see that it's kind of like a game. A game in space where you get points for uploading certain kinds of pictures. And so over a two month period, they had about 100,000 photos submitted by uh, 45 players. And they're able to get these kinds of reconstructions. Of, I don't know if you've been to, seen any of these buildings. Um, they, they, look, they look quite good. Uh, so this is, there are several things about this that are very, very nice. Um, so the, the design that they have solved lots of these distributed data collection problems in a very nice way. So one is the data collection is all standardized because it uses cameras. So one of the problems with eBird is that some people are better birders than other people and the cameras solves that problem. Um, Another problem with eBird is how do you verify the data that you have? 
it's actually quite tricky. They have developed a pretty extensive system, but if I say that I see 10 Canada geese here, like it's very hard for them to know if I'm right or wrong. With Photo City, they're able to do verification by comparing overlap with existing images that they already have. So by doing the overlap, they can say, oh, this is not actually a picture of yours Hall, and they can get rid of it. Um, and then lastly, the game points are assigned based on how valuable the data is to the building reconstruction. So you get points based on the number of pixels that get used in the reconstruction. So it, it trains players to allocate their attention to the data that's most valuable. So in eBird, you know, we have no data from North Dakota and Nevada, or very little data because that's not where the people are. And so this system sort of trains people to collect data where it's most valuable. Um, so I think this is great. They have this, in the paper, they have some, these quotes from players about what strategies they used to play this game. Um, and I just think it, it's kind of neat to see these. So I tried, uh, I tried to approximate the time of day and lighting that some pictures were taken. This would help me prevent rejection by the game. But that said, cloudy days were the best by far when dealing with corners because less contrast helped the game figure out the geometry from my pictures. There's another quote. When it was sunny, I utilized my camera's anti-shake features to allow myself to take photos while walking around a particular zone. This allowed me to take crisp photos while not having to stop my stride. Also, a bonus, less people stared at me. And the last one. Uh, taking many pictures of one building with a 5 megapixel camera, then coming home to submit sometimes up to 5 gigs on a weekend shoot was my, prim was my primary photo capturing strategy. Organizing photos on an external hard drive by campus region, building, and then phase provided a good hierarchy to structure uploads. So I put these up here to show that these people are thinking pretty carefully about how to collect this data. Um, and so if you design the right system, you can get very creative interesting things that you would not have expected to begin with. Um, so I think this is a great example of the, a design that encourages people to be creative and thoughtful in what they're doing. Um, so to review this distributed data collection, um, participants can contribute information about themselves, potentially other people, uh, although there are very few examples of that. Um, I think because there's complicated ethical issues of people reporting on each other. Um, and actually, I, saw, well, I wish I remember who said, there's one paper where they talk about this as the secondhand smoking problem. So even if you're potentially giving data about yourself, you're potentially also sending in data about the people that you're talking to. This could cause other problems. Or you can give data about objects like buildings or birds. Um, with good design, you can focus uh, participants to provide the most useful data. And with technology, the verification of data can be improved. So I think. The changes in technology are one of the most sort of exciting things in the area of distributed data collection because it removes a lot of the participant skill that's required and it makes the verification or overlap. If you have enough people doing it, you can use overlap to do this kind of verification. Um, okay, so, ooh, okay, time is kind of short. Um, I want to close by thinking a little bit about is this really possible for social science? Um, so none of the examples come from social science. So you might wonder, well, maybe there's good reason for that. And um, maybe, I don't know. Uh, so in general, when someone talks about something new, you should wonder if it's such a great idea, why has no one done it before? Because um, like a lot of really smart people have been working as sociologists for a really long time. And so if these were such great things, then probably we would have already done them. Uh, but what I would argue is that they just weren't possible before. Um, so within the last five to ten years, technology has changed in such a way to enable new forms of mass collaboration that just were not possible before. So the fact that we haven't seen these things does not mean that they are not possible. It just means they haven't been possible for very long. Um, and so I think in all of these areas, technology, particularly the web, uh, will enable enables these things that weren't possible before. So now what I'd like to do to close is I'd like to try to generalize from these uh, cases that I've talked about to give some design principles. So if you were going to try to do uh, one of these mass collaboration projects, how should you design it? And before I do present 
these sort of design principles, though, I should be very careful to say that I've only presented you successful projects. And there are a lot of these projects that fail. And so trying to generalize from these successful projects is very dangerous. But I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, <laughs> but keep that in mind. Uh, well, it may not be dangerous if you want to produce successful recipes. <laughs> but it could be that many of the failed projects have also had these similar structures. Um, so the first design principle, I think, is that you have to have a plan for recruiting participants. Like All of these require people. Um, so you have to have some way of thinking about why people are going to do this. Are they going to do it because it's fun? Are they going to do it because they're already doing it anyway? Are they going to do it because they want to help you? Why are, why are people going to do it? But then you also have to realize that your plan probably won't work. Um, so I want to give some, this, this is actually one of the, when I talk to people about this, this is one of the things that comes up over and over again. Like, well, why would anyone do this? Um, so I want to address that. Um, because I think people are thinking about it really in the wrong way. So when people say, why would anyone do this? What they're sort of thinking is, I wouldn't do this, and I don't know anyone that would do this, so no one's going to do this. And that's a natural way to think about the world. But, so that starts from yourself and sort of looks out. But let's flip that around a little bit and start with, let's say there are billions of people connected to the internet. Uh, if one in a million do this project, it's a huge success. If one in a billion do the project, it's probably a failure. And so we're not very good at distinguishing between a one in a million and a one in a billion participation rate. And so, and to sort of make this more clear, a lot of these participants are people that the researchers never, ever would have thought of at the beginning. So I want to give two very concrete human examples. The first person on the left is Aida Burgess. She is a grandmother of two who lives in Puerto Rico, has no training as an astronomer, but is a heavy contributor to Galaxy Zoo. She's classified tens of thousands of galaxies. And I'm sure that when they were sitting thinking of, of Galaxy Zoo, they were in Oxford at the time, in a pub, supposedly, <laughs> which is where all good ideas start, I guess. Uh, there's no way they thought, well, I know who's going to do this. It's <laughs> a grandmother of two in Puerto Rico. It's just, th there are people out there. Um, another person is this guy, Scott uh, Boots Zaccanelli. He lives in Texas and works at a plumbing supply store during the day, and at night he does protein folding. And he's one of the best protein <laughs> folders in the world. I am sure that the biologists, uh, they were at the University of Washington, were not thinking of him when they were building their protein folding game. There's lots of people out there in the world. I mean, that's, there's just so many people who are connected to the internet, and we just have no good intuition about most of them. The world that we live in is very small relative to the entire world. Um, the second design principle uh, is you need to have a way of focusing attention where it's most useful. So this is something Michael Nielsen talks about in his book about open science. And I think the Simon Funk example is a great one. Uh, this was a very good idea, and people became aware of it very quickly. Um, whereas if there was no clear... So, the attention of people and their effort is the scarce resource. And so you need some way of focusing that where it's most useful. And that can come from having a leaderboard. That can come from serving people pictures of galaxies that are the hardest to classify. Some kind of way of focusing people's attention. Because if you don't, you're wasting the very limited resource that you have of people's time and, and mental effort. Um, and then the third design principle would be to enable surprise. Um, and there's a great example of this from Galaxy Zoo. This is uh, a galaxy. Um, it's a quite unusual one, though, which you would not know unless you looked at lots of galaxies. But if you looked at lots of galaxies, you would see this picture and you would think, that's strange, because that galaxy is green. And there aren't very many green galaxies, apparently. Um, so someone uploaded this picture of this green galaxy into the Galaxy Zoo forum. There's a, basically a place where Galaxy Zoo people can email with each other and talk. And then other people started uploading pictures of green galaxies. And then someone had the great idea of naming these things green peas. And so then lots of people started uploading pictures of these peas and talking about what they are and why are these green. 
And like over time, in these forums, these people were basically like figuring out what was going on. Someone figured out how to look at the Sloan Digital Sky Survey database and figure out what the spectra of these things are. It got like quite complicated. And eventually there was such a huge thread of discussion about these things that the astronomers, the professional astronomers took notice and started researching these as well. And they said, what are these green peas? And so now they've published a paper in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society about these green peas. And several other astronomers have now published papers about these green peas because this was a new kind of galaxy that people hadn't seen before. And so even though Galaxy Zoo is a, a human computation project where you think the role of the people is this very simple thing of saying, is this a spiral, is this an elliptical, or doing this very simple task, they, were, they had designed the system in such a way that there was this forum where new things could happen that they didn't expect. And it's similar to the folded example where they let people make their own recipes. So if you can enable somehow in your system to be surprised, these people will often come up with things that are really cool. You don't know what they are at the beginning, but you have to try to make your system have that sort of filter out of it somehow. Um, and so all that sort of leads us back to Wikipedia. Um, and, you know, so 10 years ago Wikipedia didn't really exist. Now Wikipedia is awesome. And I hope that within the next 10 years we, as social scientists, can figure out how to do this kind of mass collaboration because I think we'll be able to solve lots of important problems. Thanks. Aren't there are some economists who have done work on Second Life? You know, that is, it's basically letting people just play the game and then they test various economics hypotheses. Uh, yeah, so virtu yeah, so virtual worlds, there's a couple things that have happened in these kind of virtual worlds like Second Life or World of Warcraft is another place where people have done research. Um, so one thing that's happened is people have used them as a test bed to recruit people for standard lab experiments. So that's one as a participant pool. Also, people have sort of observed behavior in these contexts. Um, and in that case, though, it seems to me that if you can observe people doing stuff, why not observe them doing stuff in, in the world, in the offline world? Well, because it's all digital, so you can record it all. It's like you, but, but so is the offline world. It's going to be all digital. You can record it all soon. Um, so, the, but the, 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 there's a neat thing that someone has tried with these uh, massively multiplayer games. So there's an economist named Castroneva who tried to build his own. And what this would allow him to do is actually like control the money supply. And so he could, for example, create more money and see how that affects prices. That would be very interesting. And that's not this yeah. kind of observational thing. Unfortunately, he found that it's very hard to, to build a massively multiplayer game that people want to play. Um, so the budget for World of Warcraft is millions and millions of dollars. It's like a like a the cost of like a major movie because they make millions and millions of dollars. And so, as a researcher, if you want to build something on that scale, I think he had a grant for I don't know a quarter of a million dollars, and he just you can't do something on that scale. Um, so I think these like. Online games are potentially interesting, but I think unless we build them ourselves as researchers, the companies are not going to let us do the kinds of things that we really would like to do. So if you approach World of Warcraft or you approach Second Life and said, how about I get to double the money supply and see what happens, they would say, no, 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 that's going to screw up. It's going to make things not as fun. Um, so I think those are definitely interesting places to look, but I think there are real challenges in that the companies won't probably let us do what we'd like to do. Yep. The biggest take home message I get from all of this is the, just the incredibly, the incredible untapped potential that human beings have and that, yeah. that isn't being tapped. But what I immediately start thinking about is going beyond the internet. In other words, I know that you're, you're emphasizing that these things are made possible by technology that didn't exist before, but applying the principles beyond the internet to sort of you know social systems and political systems such that people's untapped potential is actually realized and I'm just curious whether you've even 
thought about that at all. Yeah, so I think the idea that there's huge amounts of potential that not, that's not being utilized is absolutely right. Um, I just think that the internet makes it easier to take advantage of those things because often like that potential or interest is very widely geographically dispersed. And so without the internet, it'd be very hard. You know, if people had to be sort of face to face while they're working on Wikipedia, it just wouldn't really be possible. So I think the internet allows people to potentially collaborate in a way that's asynchronous and sort of a geographic. And I think that's one of the keys to making a lot of these systems work. Because many of them work with only a very relatively small number of people you know, relative to the set of people on the earth who are doing them. So you need some way of having those people being able to work together, even if they're not all in the same place. Yeah? Uh, one of the themes that certainly go through your whole talk, and I think it's been alluded to, is this, the whole idea of motivation. How do you motivate people to do this? So do you know of any work that actually looked at um, motivation based on knowledge about a topic. I mean, mm -hmm. can, you, can you provide information, education, experiences, and does that in any way enhance motivation for people to participate? Mm -hmm. So th there is a lot of work on, on motivation, and it sort of goes in a couple of main categories. So there's one school of work uh, by people like Robert Kraut that focus on using basic social psychological principles to design these kind of online communities to encourage participation. So social psychologists know about like social loafing and then you would try to design a system and you can even do experiments to see to what extent you can um, use these kind of general principles to motivate contribution. I think that approach is kind of hard because the principles are quite so general at this point that it doesn't really tell you exactly what to do. Um, so a second approach is to look at what actually is happening and then do surveys or interviews with participants and find out why they're doing it. And that generally is sort of atheoretical. They're just like, why are you guys doing this? And so I think hopefully what we're going to see is more sort of in the middle that you sort of blends these more general principles with these more concrete instantiations. And I think a lot of people are working on that now. And I think one nice thing is that a lot of this stuff can be done experimentally. So Galaxy Zoo could build in experiments where half the people see a certain kind of feedback after they rate a galaxy, another half see a different kind of feedback, and then they could measure which is actually more likely to promote the kind of behavior that they want. If, if I can extend yeah. that as well, to sort of the concept of uh, that you mentioned about is sort of doing good things. I mean, helping science, helping it. Yeah. And so if people sort of knew why protein folding mm -hmm. was yeah. important and, you know, essentially has to do with drug receptors, yeah. um, it, if you provide that information, does that? Yeah, so know? that's harder to empirically measure the effect of that. So uh, fold it does do that. I think Galaxy Zoo actually does a great job of communicating back with their community. Uh, they have a blog, and they publish stuff. They put on this blog stuff about all their papers that have come out of the data. They explain what the papers are about. They have links to the papers. They put features of different uh, members of the community on the blog. They have uh, the graduate students who use some of the data come onto the blog and write about what their graduate students are doing with the data. So I think the Galaxy Zoo team is doing a very good job of fostering their community. Because they realize that that's sort of what it is. Without the community, Galaxy Zoo is just a website. It's just a bunch of code. Right? The community is really what it is. And they're, they're I think, um, doing a really good job of nurturing that with these kind of ideas you're talking about. Yeah? When, when I visited the Wikimedia Foundation, they last spring gave a talk uh, they were really concerned about what they felt was a kind of deterioration in the Wikipedia community because of the asymmetries of participation over time. So there's a hard core of Wikipedians who've been around for a long time and who identify with it tremendously. And 
some of them are quite hostile to newcomers, and, they're, and they've established a set of norms as to how you're supposed to behave on Wikipedia, and they really just demolish people you know, yeah. who don't abide by those norms. And so there's this problem of the evolution, the endogenous evolution of the culture inside of the community, which kind of gets out of control. That is, yeah. the, Wiki, the Wikimedia Foundation, which runs the servers and has uh, 60 paid staff who design the software and do all the other background stuff, they try to kind of intervene to shape the culture, but they can't do it that well. Yeah. So one, one of the reasons for their, this big initiative, this kind of global education initiative, mm -hmm. where they're trying to get universities connected to Wikipedia to get professors to start assigning Wikipedia writing projects, which I did last semester and the ASA is now sponsoring to try to get sociologists to do it, is partially an effort to, to create a massive influx of people who, mm -hmm. for certain types of topics, know a lot about it and aren't going to be intimidated by these hard-ass <laughs> professional Wikipedians who are trying to protect the culture. Right? So it's, there's really this, from the point of view of the sociology of culture and how cultures form and then how they can be strategically changed or not. Yeah. You know, this is incredible. And it's all, it, a lot of it's bound up with the question of how the motivations change and the mm -hmm. heterogeneity of motivations. Yeah, the Wikipedia culture is, is super interesting. I've actually had a Wikipedia, I created a Wikipedia page that got deleted <laughs> by one of these editors who said that I didn't do it in the right format or whatever. It was kind of discouraging. Um, but yeah, so Wikipedia, I think, is a very unusual case in that the community has so much control over the thing itself. Right. Whereas, like in a lot of these other things, Galaxy Zoo or Foldit, the researchers are still sort of largely in control. Um, it, it may be the case that as those projects evolve over time, the, they could run into these kind of Wikipedia problems. I mean. They, sh they should be so lucky that they have so many people who care about what they're doing so much. Um, but uh, it is an interesting case. Like, we don't have a very long life history of any of these things, right? All of these things are relatively short because, yeah, they just didn't exist before. It's not clear how these things will evolve over time. Yeah? Well, also, I would think that, um, you know, to what degree are, are uh, people who are using these thinking about the technology, or what role is it in thinking about what the role of the technology plays? That is, you know, if you're doing any of these experiments and you're doing it, say, using, you know, mouse, you know, movement versus touchscreen movement versus other ways of interacting with the technology, I mean, that could even uh, go back to this problem of motivation, which ones are, you know, tactilely, you know, mm -hmm. attracted uh, to do as opposed to those that aren't, you know, and what, which ones are visual, for example, and which ones are more text-based. Mm -hmm. uh, so, anyway, those kinds of things. Yeah, so I think a lot of that thinking definitely went into Fold It. They're like, they really tried to make it fun. There's, like, there's music. Like, there's, um, like, when you, when you do some, they have a, like, set of very easy puzzles to start with. And so as you solve this puzzle, it makes this very nice noise. Uh, I, that to me sounds a lot like the noise a slot machine makes when it pays out. <laughs> I don't know if that's where they got the idea from, but I'm sure that noise that a slot machine makes is a very highly engineered sound to access something deep in our brains. Um, and so a lot of care goes into designing these things. Some of the other projects which I didn't talk about do not have that same level of care in the design. And I think that's something that sort of prevents them from being successful. One of the challenges with these things is that uh, most people on the internet are used to interacting with beautiful websites. So like Google, the New York Times, Facebook. Most people interact with those web, the most popular websites, and those websites all have awesome designers. And so the standards that people have for websites are really, really high. They want it to look like Google. And so that's really hard as a researcher to design something that's as beautiful as Google. And so, but some of these uh, projects are able to, to overcome that problem, but some aren't, and then it's a challenge for them. I think we need to draw this to a close. It's uh, endlessly interesting, and we'll pursue it some more tomorrow. Thanks.